Let's go to the Lord. Be sure that you've confessed any known sin, mental, verbal, overt sins, so that you can be back in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He can be your teacher. Father, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross and took our sins and went through death and came back the other side and became the firstborn from the dead. Paul's going to talk about it. He became the beginning, the beginning of a race of super men, women, super creatures uh, in our resurrection bodies. He's the first one that he could fly. He could walk through walls. He could eat without getting fat. We're going to be supermen, superwomen, whatever we are. I don't know if they're going to be gender or not, Lord, but I know that in eternity we're going to have it all. But right now we're in time, and we're we're in the stress and difficulties of the devil's world trying to use your word to walk with you, to listen to you, to be surrendered to you, to be your servants, to be for you to use us to communicate the message that you have for us. So I pray that you give us wisdom tonight, Father, and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Uh, I've had quite a few inquiries from different sources about uh, what are my thoughts about where we are in the election. And uh, let me just say it simply. The election's not over with. We don't know which way it will go. But we know that God is the one who is going to be in charge of that. And so whatever he decides is best for us, the church. You see, God doesn't, God doesn't uh, organize the nations of the world around what's best economically, what's best for people's pocketbooks, none of those things. He, he, the, the nations are about the believers. They're an environment for believers to live in, to grow in, to serve in, that best it gives us the best opportunity and advantage to grow to to face adversity, even the terrible adversity of persecution. All through history, this has happened. You know, in America, we became very complacent, thinking that this could never be taken down. And um, message audio. I'm not going to do that. Sorry, Roger. Uh, and we we began to believe that, you know, nothing could take away our freedom, even though we've seen it encroached and encroached and encroached and more and more control. Government got bigger and bigger, deeper and deeper into our pocketbooks, into our life. We just sort of went to sleep at the switch thinking, you know, there are, there are lines that they cannot cross. Well, legally, that's the case. But our our nation no longer operates legally. Uh, there's a there's a group of very powerful elites that have ga- ganged up together, including the media. They have people all through the government. They're uh, in the in this big tech thing, and they want to run the world. They are very very powerful, and they want to run the world. And they have ganged up together, and they don't care about the rules. They really don't. They care about getting their way, gaining the objective. And they will game the rules and pretend that they're following the rules. They will point out whenever you or I don't follow the rules, but they won't follow them themselves. And so at least, you know, for the last 16 years, I mean, excuse me, for the last 12 years, this has been going on. The first day we really didn't know, Trump comes along and, and rips the cover over all off of all of the corruption that's been going on in our nation, in our government, with our media, with, with corp- huge corporations, this, this incredible sucking dry of the uh, middle class, the people that actually produce and he's exposed it all now what happens from here it's in god's hands let me read you this jeremiah 17 5 through 17 chapter 17 verses 5 through 9 thus said the lord 
Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the desert, and he will not know prosperity when it comes. Listen to that. The guy who's focused on the earthly, focused on human solutions, human situations. The whole progressive movement is focused on an equal outcome. Everyone must have the same. So they're focused on all these human solutions. They, they honor no God. They honor no God except himself. He says, these people won't know what's good. Then lest that be you or I, we need, to, we need to hang on to the Lord, let him decide about the politics, and, of course, participate and be an active part of it as you so desire. Those are honorable uh, actions on your part, but we don't depend on that. We can live in any kind of, under any kind of government, in any society, and prosper as Christians. We're only here for a time. And this time that we're here is not to build an earthly kingdom of any kind, not even America. So he says, this guy who trusted man will live in stony waste places in the wilderness. Then he says, but blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by water that extends its roots into the water, in the stream, will not fear when the heat comes, the pressure, the adversities of life when it comes. Listen, if this whole thing goes south and goes go, like it has been going, if you're, if you're a liberal person, you can do anything. If you're a conservative person, you're called on everything. You're punished. It's a terrible situation. It doesn't seem to be anyone that's able to stand up to it. Don't understand that personally, but do know that the Lord's in control of it. He said, the, "It's your leaves, your production will be green. You will not be anxious in a year of drought. See, we're, we, we might be going into a year of drought in an earthly type situation. Nor cease to yield fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. The heart of man programmed by old man beliefs all of our life. We're born into sin. We have a nature to sin. Uh, we don't have God in our life to give us truth. So growing up, we develop all the wrong ideas about life. And we put those things in our heart. Those things stay in our heart till we literally remove them. Spent 26 lessons with Dr. Patel talking about that. Those, those lessons are available. I would encourage you to listen to them. That is the preparation for being able to handle the situation when it goes bad from a human standpoint. It never goes bad from God's standpoint. You see, everything, God uses everything for divine good, for our growth, for our production, for us to become who he wants us to be, who he made us to be, and for us to get the highest and best out of this life. I mean, listen, here's the crunch when you really understand what's happening. Is, do, is how much suffering are you willing to accept for his sake to earn the rewards and be who you want to be in the next life? How much suffering are you willing to accept before you crumble, before you go time out? Listen, these guys, like Paul, they, they kept the faith all the way through. They never gave it up, no matter what happened to them. This Paul guy, he went through so many things, so many really difficult hardships in his life. And he stayed the course. He never gave it up. He never veered off. So that's my thing about the election. Listen, let's, let's pray that God honor truth, that truth and righteousness are, will prevail, that the truth about all what's happened will come out. Let's pray that. But if it's not God's time to reveal that or to or to prosper us in this earthly manner, then so be it. Listen, don't be upset. I mean, I'm upset. I'm I've I have been heart sick for days. And I know you are, too. 
just at the thought that somebody could come in literally and take away our government, our country, and, and enslave us. It may happen. I don't want it to happen, but it may happen. If it does, God is still with you. You're still saved. You're still secure. Logistical grace uh, can't be stopped. Everything that you need is going to be provided. It may not be what you're used to or what you want it to be, but it's going to be a provision for you to do the will of God, produce the fruit that he desires, uh, develop the growth that will be best for you. All of that will stay intact. Nothing earthly, nothing anyone can do can take that away from you. That which is important, what really counts in your life, cannot be removed. You understand? Cannot be removed. We got to get our eyes off the earthly stuff. Get your eyes off that. It's not that important. Look, I, I I want it to go what I think is the right way, very much. But if it doesn't, I'm not going to be destroyed. Maybe maybe disturbed, maybe a bit upset at, at the least. But I'm not going to be destroyed because my life is in the Lord. It is not in this in this world. It's not in the in America. As much as I love my country, my country is not the Lord. And therefore, we need to stay tightly. We need to keep an eye on that and let it go. Let it go. Visualize yourself grabbing hold of all that and letting it go. Giving it to God. Absolutely. All right. That's my little talk, my little pep talk about the election and about earthly things. Let's talk about Colossians. Because we're going to be all in this. I can't help but talk about it. So stay tuned. We've been in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, the resume of the Son of God, God the Son. And it's an incredible resume. We're, in, we've, we're, we're going to continue with our discussion and try to understand. Here's what I've seen through this study. I never understood what the whole point of of the logos, the word, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I never really delved into that or looked deeply into it. That's the word logos. Word is logos. And the logos was a, was a person, a creature, in the minds of these people, starting with about 500 B.C., coming up to the time of Christ. They all thought the logos was a created being. The, he, the Logos was the one who created the universe. They knew that. He's the one that held the universe together. And yet they thought he was a creature, not a creator, not God. They didn't think he was God. And so both Paul and John come along and when they write these things. They're not just picking out attributes of God and putting them down on paper. They're actually answering questions that were in the minds of all the people in the first century. All these people come into the church in the first century and they're answering these questions. Who is the Logos? Who created? Did God create? Did he have to create uh, a, a, a someone that could create because God couldn't touch evil? A lot of questions were being asked, just like today in, in our world, there's a lot of questions being asked. I mean, what about uh, same-sex uh, relationships and marriage. What about that? What does the Bible say about it? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about it, but nobody wants to hear it right now. You can't hardly bring it up because it offends people and they they call you all kind of names. You know, we're in a time when people are not open to truth. They've decided that there is no such thing as truth. That was war, That was what they were dealing with in the Colossians church, they had decided there was no such thing as the truth, no absolutes that they had put together. And I mean, they were searching for a, uh, an ultimate human truth. That's why they were putting all these systems together to try to find the essence of all these different ways of looking at life, to find the true uh, principles from a human standpoint that apply to all these different uh, situations in a, Hey, Emo. Uh, hey, guys, I didn't see all of you. There's Melkor and Linda and Cindy and Diane. Good to see y'all. All right. So they were 
the culture of the day had these beliefs that were the accepted ideas of the time. All right. So let's get into them a little bit. In 60 AD, when Paul writes, the church was having an influx of people steeped in pagan, pagan religious traditions and different philosophies. The young church was being challenged by ideas common to the culture, just like we are. People come in, listen, the common thing today, I do a lot of marriage counseling. So it's, it's the number one kind of counseling that I do. And a lot of it these days is people living together. They just do it. You can't tell, you can't talk them out of it. I mean, you, maybe your kid, your grandchildren are going to do that. They think it's the right way to go. They don't understand that uh, uh, first marriages, the divorce rate now is down to about 40%. Second marriages, it's about 75%. People who live together before marriage, it's 80%. People who live together before marriage, eight out of 10 times, these are the world stats, will divorce. It, it, it destroys the whole thing. It destroys the whole protection of the woman's soul. It just takes it all away. All this, all the special things that are supposed to be in that, you lose it. It becomes mundane, you know, and not all of them, but it, it, it's God gives us these guidelines and rules for a reason. So these guys were being challenged by the by the culture of the day, like we are. At the right time, God provided a greater revelation. To clarify these ideas related to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Now, by the time of Christ, the Gnostics were beginning to develop their ideas. It wasn't fully developed yet, but all this stuff was in the culture. They believed these particular people that we're dealing with, and, and you know why we how we know this? Because these are the things that Paul talked about. If you read ahead in chapter two, you see he's talking about those people that worshiped angels. He followed the ascetic practices, all these different things that they prescribed to make you wise. Now, they had combined Plato's form theory, which they had concluded that meant that everything in the immaterial world was pure. Everything in the physical, physical matter was corrupted and evil. Therefore, God, who's pure, pure spirit, could not touch corrupted material. He couldn't have created the universe. He couldn't be uh, the God-man. That's impossible. If that's true, if Plato's theory is true, and it was a very widely accepted belief in that time, very much so. Just like for the longest time in the Middle Ages, they thought the earth was the middle of the universe, that everything revolved around the earth. Go figure. All right. Plato's form theory Eastern dualism, which said that there's no no real good. Good and evil are equal uh, and pull on each other. And that keeps everything, the yin and the yang, going back and forth. You know, it's a, and there's no real good or no real evil. You know, and it's just perspective, the how you look at it. They had, they had incorporated all of those, all of those ideas with the Mosaic Law. They had taken Moses... The first five books and the books, the ideas of Moses that he communicates, and they combined them with Plato and Eastern dualism. They, they had created a, their own system, and that's what they were doing. And then, see, and then Christ comes along, and now they've got these three systems they're trying to combine together. See, they were looking for 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 something that was similar in all of them to to find the core essence principles, thinking they could find the core essence of life. Now, Christianity comes along. It's very spectacular. Uh, initially, it comes with these miracles like Paul and all the miracles he did early on and Peter. And this the, this got this great reputation. And now they're going to come into, try to come into the church and combine all of that stuff with Christian doctrine. Well, of course, it doesn't work. It can't be because Christian doctrine excludes those things. So. The most prominent figure and contributor to this way of thinking was Philo of Alexandria. He uh, he was a Christian, we think. He had a lot of Christian writings, so we believe he was saved, but he kept trying to pull all this other stuff together and synchronize it into uh, a whole system. He didn't accept the scriptures 
uh, in their purity. Now, when people reject the idea of absolute truths, human viewpoint always wants to find a way to take the prominent theories in the culture and combine them, you know, not only to include everybody and give respect, you know, and a high five to everybody's ideas, but again, they're trying to find the core essence of all the ideas to to find the you know the the vein of life, the 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 hit the gold vein, you know, of thought. So if man can find a central theme by which all of the ideas of the ancients can be wedded together, there's no need for God or or absolute truth. No need for it. They found a way to live a satisfactory, contented life without God. They think that's all there is. So, based on Plato's form theory, all matter is evil, he concluded, Philo, that the Logos, what John says is Jesus, was the first created being of God. He was what? He was the first thing that God created. So, he was the most pure of God's creation, although not total, certainly wasn't deity. He is the one who created or supervised the creation of the world. And he was the one in whom it was all held together. He is the key to it. Now, the theory, God was unable to touch physical matter, so he couldn't be the creator. God had created a being almost pure to oversee the creation, the Logos. It was this guy, God had created to oversee everything, and he was he was called Philo. This is long before John wrote the book of John. Philo called him the Logos. You understand how significant that is? That when you when John comes along in 70 AD and writes, In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, kept on being God. It's like he's blowing the whole Plato form theory out of the water. He's refuting it. He's rejecting it. And he's saying, guys, that whole theory is false. Can't include it in Christianity. So the purity of the doctrine was an important thing. I know it's difficult in our day to accept that purity of the doctrine is important, but it's important. I mean, all these guys are writing to refute these theories of the day trying to incorporate with Christianity. And this is that's what I've learned this time going through this. I, I really never understood the whole wide depth of this word logos and why these guys, Paul and John, are writing these things about Christ. They didn't just have an inspiration one day and go, I'm going to write a bunch of really beautiful things about the Lord. Listen, they were answering specific issues and questions that were, were going on in the church at the time. Philo used a number of terms to describe this first cre creating create creation of God. He called him the Logos, the word, which is the, means the word, the account, the idea, the logic. Logos meaning logic. Uh, he's the first created being who is the creator, the one who maintains the orderly behaviors of the universe. He keeps everything orderly. Uh, the Logos was not God in Philo's. Uh, idea, uh, but the first level of creation. He also called him the icon, the image, image and manifestation of God, but not God. Now, what does Paul say in verse 15, chapter 1? He says, Christ is the icon of God, of the invisible God. He's saying he is God. So we're refuting these things. All right. The historical background helps us understand why the writers are saying this. If you read Colossians chapter 2, you're going to get into a lot more detail about what these people were saying. These false, these and listen, all these people, we talk, call it the Colossian heresy, as if a bunch of people ganged up on the corner and said, we're going to go in and attack this church with our false ideas. It wasn't like that. These people held to these ideas. They were all thinking these ideas through, now, this is from the human perspective. From the demonic perspective, this was an attack. The humans didn't think it that way. They wanted to incorporate it into their way of thinking. They're like, hey, there's a new way 
uh, they called it the way, you know, these Christians, and they've got these different ideas about how things work. Let's go and see if we can understand some truths and incorporate it, and then we'll we'll take it and we'll be the smartest people ever. And that's how they thought. Now, the Gnostic view was that Christ, in both the Old Testament and New Testament, called the angel of the Lord, was not deity, but the high, but was the Logos, this, this highest and most pure creature, creature that God ever created. They rejected the hypostatic union. When they heard the hypostatic union, Paul teach that, they went, that can't be true. God's going to become a man. They rejected Christ as our human savior and mediator. Look, they said this guy, God cannot be physical matter. That's a settled thing in their mind. It had been settled for 300 years, coming out of Plato, who was very influential and still is, actually, one of the most influential people in human history, Plato, Aristotle, those guys. All right. When Paul, operating under apostolic, apostolic authority, uses these words to describe the beloved Son of God, excuse me, the Son of the Father, this is verse 12 through 14. I know it's been a long time since we read those. But he says, we have the redemption through the beloved Son of God the Father, in whom, you know, we have this redemption. And then he, then he goes into this tirade about who he is, his, his resume. Paul is refuting the false view that our Savior is a created being and asserting the truth that he is God. There are people that I have met that don't believe Christ was deity. They believe he was a created person, that he wasn't, he wasn't in eternity past, and that he wasn't God, God the Son. He, he was a, just a man, you know, a special man, of course, and they got reasons they believe this. You know, they look at the scriptures and interpret it. I don't see how they can be consistent and interpret it because it's clear he's deity. If you're going to follow the Bible. Now, in 70 AD, John would make another strong statement refuting the core ideas of the Gnostic heresy. By 70 AD, this was really picking up steam. These Gnostic guys were forming like official. Earlier in the Christian church, you know, 30 to 40 AD, this was just beginning and these ideas were in the culture, but these people began to pull this thing together into an actual comp competing type system with the church. If you read John 1, 1 through 18, let's read. I'm going to read you John 1, 1 through 4. This is John refuting these people that are trying to infiltrate the church. In the beginning was the word, the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And it's an, it's an imperfect tense, meaning he kept on being God. He, had, he was God. He is God. He will be God. He kept on being God. He was in the beginning with God. All things have come into existence by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him, and listen, here was the kicker. This created being, in him was life, zoe, eternal, spirit life. And that life was the light of men. He's saying, guys, this Logos guy, this Word guy that you're talking about, he's God the Son who became a man. And they had that all mixed up, all mixed up. How many people today who go to, quote, a church? And by the way, let me say again, every building and every group of people that call themselves a church are not a church. The only people that are actually a church, part of the church, are those who are saved by grace through faith, and not of themselves, it's a gift of God. They believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and they're born again. That When you're born again, you're part of the church. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. You can call yourself, uh, you can sit in the uh, garage and call yourself an automobile. You won't become a Volkswagen. It's not going to happen. You know. So you can say you're a church, but if you believe in works for salvation or works for the Christian way of life, you're trying to earn something from God. You're looking at people's morality and condemning other people for the way that they live. And yet you, you, you know, 
This is all the legalistic religion that is just dominating. Two kinds of religion that are dominating in America. One is the legalistic and the other is the emotionalism. The emotionalism, the charismatics, are the, is the fastest growing church uh, organization all over the world because they excite people. They get people pumped up. You know, it's fun. And therefore, they buy into it. You know, if it gets them saved, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, you know. But you can't grow that way. It's a terrible thing for growth. You know, they get you get hyped up every week, and then you go down. You get hyped up every week, and then you go down. And you never really get anywhere. You just get puffed up, and then you go down. So, now, this is 11. The devil uses religion and world philosophies to distort man's view of God. Here's what you need to understand. This is what I'm learning. I've been, I've been looking at all these demonic things. I've been looking at what, what did Lucifer say to eat? God's holding back on you. There's more to this, and he doesn't even want you to know about it. He, he's keeping the good stuff for himself. You should have the right to do whatever you want and explore whatever you want. This thing about good and evil, why would God hold you back, woman? Go, girl. You go, girl. Exactly what he said to her. You know what she did? She bought, she bought in. She bought in. The terrible thing is that the, her husband's standing there with her, and he, said, he doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word. As a marriage counselor, I've seen this many times, where uh, a man and woman are not getting along, things aren't going well, and because of that, she becomes very controlling, demeaning even, and he learns that the best thing for him to do to keep peace in his life is just be quiet. There's nothing he can do. He can't keep beat her up, can't make her submit, can't make her to have peace in the Lord for her to be able to relax and let the Lord handle the situation. When you don't have that kind of maturity, it's a difficult thing. So I don't know if that's what happened, but for some reason, Adam has learned to be quiet. Let his wife take the lead. And not only let her take the lead, but to follow her into destruction. So that's what happened. Look look at what he, t- he said about Job. Now see, in eternity past, Lucifer had it all. He was God's high priest. This is Ezekiel chapter 28. He was God's high priest. He, he had all the stones of the high priesthood. He had his own garden. The Garden of Eden on the earth was a place that, that Lucifer hung out. He and the angels hung out here. It was, like a, it was like a vacation spot. And one day, for whatever reason, he got thinking too much of himself. He, he, I think he wanted more, just like he told Eve. He saw that there was more to life than his role, this, this, these limits that God had put on him. And God said, this is what I made you for. This is what I created you to do. That Those are your limits. Live within those limits and be content within those limits. He said, no, I, I want more than that. And when God refused, he got angry and he began to, gossip and he began to malign God and put God down and say God's not fair. God's holding back on us. There's more that we should be having. I mean, why is why don't I have more in my life? Why don't I have more love? Why don't I have more free time? More more pleasure? I mean, these things exist, God. If you love me, why don't you give me all those things? You know? And this was Lucifer. And when he got angry, he got bitter. He convinced these other guys to go with him. They say, we're going to defeat God and this destroy God. We're going to take over God's universe, and we're going to be God. Yeah, I can hear God laughing now. But when that happened, God shut him down, and he took everything away from Lucifer. You know, he stripped him of his position, of his possessions, you might say. Well, what is, the, what is the chapter one of Job talk about? He comes to God and says, hey, what's happening? And then God says, well, have you looked at my servant Job? 
God, of course, God's the one that brought Job up. So hello. But he says, well, no wonder he serves you. You've given him everything. You know, if you take everything away from him, like you did me, he will curse you like I did. He sees justifying himself. He said, my circumstances, you were so unfair to me when I wanted more and I got upset. I think I thought I could handle more and you wouldn't let me have it. And then I got angry and I turned against you and then you just dropped the hammer on me. See, I thought God, I think God offered him a way out like he does us, a way of being saved, if you will, to be. See, we're called the elect and the saved angels are called the elect. I don't know how that came about, but here's the point. Here's Lucifer's program is to get us to see God in a wrong way as the demanding father, as the angry, judgmental father, you know, as the guy who won't let you have what you want, who's always keeping you pushed down. You know, this unfair God that if you mess up, he's going to get you. I don't know how many people I've talked to who for years have felt like God was looking for an opportunity to get back at them for some terrible thing, terrible in their mind that they had done. People live their whole lives thinking that God somehow, some way, is looking for an excuse to drop the hammer on them. And trust me, if God wanted to do that, he would he, he could easily do that any time. But he doesn't. So that's not who he is. It's not who he is. So let me tell you else who he's not. He's not a guy that steps back and picks out those that he wants and makes sure that they come into the kingdom and then just lets the rest go. Forget about them, you know, let them go to hell. I don't believe that. I just don't think that's who we're worshiping. It's not that guy. And look, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I don't believe that. I don't think that's who he is. And I think knowing who he is is maybe the most important thing for the Christian to understand who he is. So the devil uses religion and moral philosophies to distort our view of God. He paints him as a selfish and greedy, as selfish and greedy that he created us so he could lord it over us. He keeps the best for himself, withholds it from us. He's vengeful. He's angry, unreasonable. He would never stoop to join himself to a creature. Are you kidding me? He's going to become a creature. Some think that that's what made it. Lucifer mad is when he said there's going to be these other creatures and I'm going to join myself to one of them permanently, forever. Lucifer thought, well, maybe he should be an angel or maybe that should be me. I should be the one that becomes, uh, you know, who knows? We don't know. We're not told. We just know that the guy went nuts and went crazy and that God is somehow letting all this play out. That is what's going on in our nation. The people that are trying to take it over have bought into one of his ideas, this idea of fairness. Everything has to be fair. You know, it reminds me of little kids. That's not fair. Life's so unfair. Life is unfair. You know, it's definitely unfair. People are born with genetic handicaps. People are born physically unable to do what others can do, or mental handicaps, or situational handicaps out of their environment because of the parents they had or the situation. People are born into war. They're born into poverty. They're born into all kinds. God allows all these things to occur so that he can prove the points that he's trying to prove. He, that's, that, that's our purpose is for him to use us in that way. So for us to react to what he allows in our life, including what's about to happen in our election, for us to react to that and, and lose it, that's not the plan of God. He's still, look, he's still with us. He's still in charge. This is just a maneuver on his part. It's just a maneuver for our benefit. Listen to that. For our benefit. Don't lose perspective on this. See, our life is not determined by the ups and downs of the, of the national situation. Of course, we want to live in freedom. We want to live in a free enterprise system where people can develop and, and, and come out of poverty on their own. 
You know, we want all those conservative ideas, the divine principles that God set up. But right now, the devil's been able to persuade a whole bunch of our people that his way is better. You know, if we just, everybody gets the same uh, impact, the same effect, everybody gets the same, you know, Lenin, Stalin, they sold the same, Mao in China sold the same idea. Uh, Castro in Cuba, these are the same slogans, the same silly ideas that somehow through human effort, we can create a utopia on the earth where everybody gets the same. You need to do a search under DuckDuckGo, not Google, forget Google. Google is a, Google is nonsense. Google is bias. And they're probably going to kick me on Facebook. Make sure I've got your email because probably soon we're going to go to a different format. If you're interested in hearing what I have to say, we're going to have to do something different because these people are going to kick us off. You know, it's just got the most people. It's the reason I use it. It's simple. It's uh, it's convenient. But oh, I forget what I'm talking about. We're talking about the devil. But anyway, the focus of the angelic conflict, the war is on influence. This is all about influence. That's why your testimony is so important. That's why keeping yourself using the law of love to keep your freedoms to yourself. See, mature Christians understand there's freedoms that we have, that things that aren't sin that the world thinks are sin or calls sin. So if they see you doing something, you know, ha having your one beer, you know, in a restaurant, they think, oh, boy, that Christian, that pastor is having, he's drinking alcohol. Holy smokes, he must not be for real. You know, he uses everything to try to uh, hurt your testimony. So the issue is influence. Who can influence? Who can win the trust and loyalty of mankind? The focus is also on ideology. Whose ideas can be used to persuade man to, to go their way, just like he did with Eve? He persuaded her that what he was saying was true, that God was holding back on her. There had to be a seed of some discontent in her for her to be vulnerable to that. You don't know. See that? You don't know how long they were there, what was actually going on between Adam and Eve in their marriage and their relationship. Maybe she had gotten bored. She made this new friend, the snake, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows exactly what happened in there? But we know the outcome now. So the ideas are important. The ideas that are being foisted on us today, crammed down our throats, have to do with equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. Everybody should get the same. You know, uh, they create issues. They, they're, they're fake issues. The climate hoax. Look, I don't have any doubt that there's issues related to carbon and all this kind of stuff. I, I mean, okay, but the answers that they're coming up with, those are, they're insane. They're freaking insane. So, you know, they think we're supposed to do, we're going to give up gasoline. We're going to give up automobiles. We're going to give up airplanes. We're going to go back to the Stone Age, just horses and buggies. Of course, you can't have cows because they fart too much. You know, it's it's insane. Their people are insane. And the things that they can, and who can believe this stuff? Then they took over our education department, our education system, and taught our kids this. This critical race theory where they teach everyone who's white is just uh yeah, genetically a racist. There's not a more racist point of view than that right there. They are the racist, but they can, they see it's all a game. It's all about influence. It's all about control and power. That's the devil's deal. And he's using the, this in, in Lenin, once Lenin had convinced all of these people to help him take over Russia, you know, and, and uh, conquer all these surrounding little countries and make the Soviet Union, you know what he called the people that helped him? Useful idiots. You know what he did with them? He, he eliminated them. Once he got them to do what he wanted to do, he convinced them that his way was right, that we're going to try this grand experiment, you know. Once he got them to go his way, he, he, he just got, he killed them all. He killed them all. So the Lucifer continues to repackage and sell the same lies to different generations. 
He has convinced several generations of the world that truth, see, once again, this comes back around. After World War II, see, in World War II, we saw what real evil was. And people were just overwhelmed with disgust toward the Nazis. You know, they wanted to conquer the world. You know, Heil Hitler and all that business. And man, we put on our boots and strapped on our gun and went to war. These heroic men who sacrificed themselves so that we can be free. Now we're giving that up from within. Don't need to be free. Free is not safe. You got to stay in your home and six feet apart and wear a mask so that everybody, so that somebody in three uh, generations, three uh, people away, or somebody's grandmother that you ran into at the grocery store, you might infect her grandmother. I'm supposed to change my whole life and give up my livelihood, my business, my job, have no income because I might get somebody sick. I, I, again, it's insane. It's insane. I'm, I'm hollering. I don't know why I'm hollering. But, but the devil's convinced several generations that truth is relative, not absolute, that, is, that God's creatures should be free to create their own reality. Quantum physics is one of the newest discoveries. It's really interesting, really neat. You want to read about it. It's really, it's Carolyn Leaf. That if you're on Wednesday night, Carolyn Leaf discusses it in her book. How at this level of existence, you know, you've got the atomic structure that's too small to see. You got molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms, and atoms are made up at the of quantum, this quantum level. I guess quarks is what they call them. But there's a whole level of existence this really, really tiny and small, but they've been able to get down there and study that, and everything works different down there. And because of that, they have come up with these theories that what people decide to believe and think actually changes the reality around them, not your perception of reality. So this is what they're trying to do. See, they think that if they can convince all the white people that they're actually our racist, they convince you you are a racist, then we will start thinking these anti-racist thoughts and it will actually change the world. Everything will change. You're, they're, cre they're trying to create their own reality through their thoughts. And look, there's a truth to that, that your own thoughts create your physical reality, your body. Your brain changes when you think something different. Your brain grows or diminishes in certain ways based on what you choose to think. True statements. But because I think something, I mean, I can sit here at my desk and think, 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 you know, that fish, I got a, I got a little, little lake, that, you know, 50 yards from this, from this desk that I'm sitting at, that, that fish are going to jump up on the shore and I can just go get them. See, these things are insane, but the devil's convinced these people they're true. They've bought into it. That we've got to change everything or the planet's going to explode. It's going to burn up. The ice caps are going to all melt, and we're going to be, are all going to drown. So people buy into it. They hear it enough, they hear it enough, they hear it enough, and they believe it. Therefore, what do they do? They turn on the people who have good common sense who are conservative in the way they approach things, who are keeping things stable, and they tear them, they tear them down. That's, what, that's what's happening in our nation right now. Now you say, can we stop it? I don't know. It's happened all over Europe. Europe is gone with this. This whole ideology, this communist, socialist, everything's got to be equal. They opened up, see, they opened up their borders, and they got an influx, a huge influx of Muslims. Now, there's whole sections of Europe where the Europeans can't go. They, they took over these neighborhoods and these sections of a city, and they blocked it off. And in there, they do Sharia law, and these people allow it. And they've taken it over. Now, Muslims don't assimilate. They refuse. They just will not do it. So, okay, but you let enough Muslims into America— with the idea that they're going to band together and create a little part, a little, you know, Iran inside of America, that's against American law. 
and rightly so. This is our, uh, this is a miracle. So anyway, now, Paul says, Jesus Christ, we're back to verse 15. He is the image, the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Philo, we're back to Philo, who created this, these false ideas about Christianity. He called the Logos, the creator, the first, this first creature, the Logos. He called him two things. He called him the icon, and he called him the firstborn. He's the firstborn of God, the firstborn, the first created thing God made. These were Philo's words. When Paul comes along, it says, God the Son, in whom we have redemption, who has paid for our sins, is the image, the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is he is using the Gnostics' own terminology. And he's throwing it right in their face and saying, the things that you are believing and teaching are false. You you have a wrong image of God. You have diminished the image of Christ. You've, you've tried to bring Christ down to your level instead of allowing him to be God. Now, I'm just getting into this place of my life where I'm really beginning to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be my next big area of, of seeking in my life. Who is Christ? And you have to start with humanity, with the things that he did, the things that he said. We're not given a lot about his background. We don't see him as a child, just glimpses. As a baby, as a 12-year-old, then he's starting his ministry. So you don't get a lot of background. But when he comes on the scene and begins to do his ministry, we're given a big picture. And I'm about to delve into all that. This passage has inspired me to do that. Uh, and so I'll carry you with me if you want to go. But this idea that Paul is using right here, he is refuting the Gnostic idea that that, that the Logos, the creator, is he called him the icon, the image, the image of God, the firstborn. Philo said he's not God. He's a created being. So now we've got Christ, our Savior, who is God, the God-man, being being proclaimed as just a man. So you can't get saved by just a man. Okay, you can't be the mediator if he's just a man. All right, so this word image, I got just a few minutes. Let me give you a few things. This word image, let me, this icon, uh, Matthew twenty two twenty. it's like the image on a coin. You know, they had Caesar's. A, uh, an image of Caesar on a coin like we do. You know, we have presidents. Uh, that That's the word icon. In the heathen cultures, Romans 1, 20, 23, they worshiped, they would make images, statues. That's an icon, an image. Genesis 1, 29, this is the Greek, this is the Septuagint of the Hebrew, that mankind is made in the image and likeness of God. Man, the word Hebrew, Selim, uh, the Greek word they used was icon. It means image. Revelation 13, 4. Talks about the image of the beast who was wounded and come back to life. They actually make a statue of him. In Hebrews ch chapter 10, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews tells us really something interesting, that the whole Old Testament system, the tabernacle, the temple, all of these instruments they had, the cherubim, the, the angels, the whole thing, these were shadow images of the of the real things in heaven. That God had made this, he had commanded them to make these things on the earth, and they reflected, they were like a direct reflection or an image, a manifestation of the things in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, he says, We have, we have borne of the bodily image of the earthly. See, this is what this body is the is the image of the earthly. So in the resurrection, we will wear the body uh, with a heavenly image. Colossians 3.10. Now, those are all physical. Look at this one. Colossians 3.10 talks about being transformed, spiritual growth. Transformation is spiritual growth. Taking off the old, putting on the new. you got to learn what the new is and build a new man belief system so that you can begin to see and challenge your own way of thinking and reject it and remove it 
And in, in the place of it, you put the new. So he says, transformation changes our hearts from old man beliefs, what we initially and originally put into our hearts as our program to live by. Our old man beliefs and lifestyle, and we, we're changed into the image, this new man image, this, he says, is made in the image of the one who created him. In other words, our old way, our old man beliefs, Paul calls it the old man, is in Adam. It's a, it's a perfect image of who man is in our corrupted self. The new man is who man is in Christ, in the new man way. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We are transformed as we look into the mirror of the Word of God. On the one side, we see ourselves. On the other, we see His image, and we are being changed into His image. As you look into the Word, it's a mirror, and you see yourself in your old way, and so that you can see yourself operating in the old way. The only way to ever get rid of old ways or old habits of thinking and behaving is to observe ourselves as we do them. When you catch yourself, that's why the first thing we studied in with Dr. Patel was pay attention, to focus on what you're saying to yourself. You got to listen to your inner dialogue. You got to pay attention to how you're feeling. And when your feelings change, you know you've just said something to yourself that caused your your emotion to uh, respond. So you're feeling fine. You tell yourself there's something terrible going to happen. All of a sudden you feel afraid. That's how that works. You pay attention. You see yourself doing that. And you go, well, I've always had a problem with being afraid. Well, why, why is that? Well, you're telling yourself things and creating images of things that would make anyone afraid. God's not doing that. The devil's not doing that. You're doing that. That's your habit. You've made it into a habit so that whenever something happens, you automatically go to fear, automatically go to anger, self-pity, self-righteousness, whatever it is. Those are the things you say to yourself. All that comes out of your belief system. Now, what does God want us to do with it? Paul said you got to take this stuff off. Doesn't mean you can squash it down and suppress it, pretend it's not there, try to live over in the new man, just keep that suppressed down. Doesn't work. It pops up all over the place. It's, it uh, it uh, leaks into every part of your life. You know, you've met people who are just kind of permanently angry, permanently sour. Those are their beliefs. Those are what they tell you. That's an old habit of seeing things and believing that their life is negative. They're disappointed and hurt about their life. And, and it shows in everything they do. The only way to ever go overcome that and have joy in Christ is to remove the beliefs and the thoughts that are telling themselves to feel that way. So that's transformation. Nothing short of that is actual real transformation. Just learning what the Word says and trying to do it doesn't work. So I have got two minutes left. I need to do this. In the last of the image in Second Corinthians four four, he said, "In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God." John fourteen nine. Uh, Philip says, "Lord, before you go, he's been telling them that they're go. He's going the upper room." I've got to leave. You can't come with me. I'll come back and get you. I'm preparing a place for you. He said, Philip. Philip says, Lord, before you go, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Show us God. And he says, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? I mean, he really got on to him. How do you say that? How can you say that, Philip? How is it you've been with me for three years and you still don't know who and what I am? He is the image of the invisible God. He's the manifestation in a human way of our creator, of the eternal God. He joined himself with a human being. He became one of us so that we can become like him. And I 
and I, and I just encourage you as we close. See, we've been going this for an hour. And I just encourage you as we close. Look, be a good citizen. Do the right thing. Follow the laws. You know, if this thing doesn't go our way, uh, as far as the election and all, just just let things play out. I don't think it's time to get our guns and go take it back. I don't know. I don't think that's the right thing, at least not for me. And that has nothing to do with my age or my health. It's just that that's not my role in this. It may be someone else's. I don't know that. I'm not advocating either way. I don't have that answer yet. I'm going to walk one day at a time and listen to the Lord. All right. But what you don't want to do is get so caught up in all that, so dependent on it going your way. that If it doesn't go your way because God has decided to, to take us a different way through, through persecution. Now, listen, you can't get the highest rewards unless you go through the dip, most difficult part of the course. And that's persecution. You know, they called it, they, the disciples, the apostles called it an honor that they had been chosen to suffer that. I'm not there yet. I'm working on it. I have to get rid of my earthly ideas of what's good and what's what I want my life to be. You know, I live with pain, physical pain, you know, infirmities of age and just my genetics, back troubles and all. I mean, it's difficult to imagine sitting in a jail cell on a concrete slab and trying to sleep. You know, that would be really difficult. So it's like, oh, boy, Lord, I don't well, I don't know if I want to go there. But he said, son, you relax. I will carry you through all of that. You just stick with me. You just honor me. You just love others. You just don't react. Don't hate these people when they, when they treat you unfairly. When you face injustice, don't return evil for evil. Return good. Return love. Pray, he said, pray for those who despitefully use you and, and, and treat you in an un, unjust way. Listen, facing injustice in the devil's world is, is when you're getting to the highest levels of opportunity to glorify God, to be rewarded in heaven. So if God's taking us, he's going to take the believer's the mature believers in America right now, if we're going to go to this, because these guys taking over, they hate Christianity more than anything. Of course, it's the devil. He hates Jesus Christ. He wants to lie about Jesus Christ and say he's someone he's not, and he's not who he really is. And he wants to demean him and diminish him and everyone who belongs to him. And therefore, he's getting a real hold on our nation and our laws and those in charge. When the police turn against you, when you can't trust them, listen, Romans 13 says submit to that. That doesn't mean you've got to go along with that. That doesn't mean that at all. Listen, I'm going to talk about that next time. I'm going to bring some perspective to Romans 13. Because I keep hearing people say, well, Romans 13, now, you know, now we've got to submit to that. Listen, you don't ever submit to anything that goes against the will of God. You, they, they're going to pass a law that says you got to report your neighbors who are worshiping or doing this or doing that. You going to do that? They're going to try to come and get your grandkids and put them into some kind of education camp. You going to try to go along with that? You go, oh yeah, well I've got to submit to that. Well, you may not have a choice. You know they may you may they may kill you. Well, look, with if they do, then you do it praising the Lord. The whole deal is about keeping your attitude and keeping your trust and your confidence and your love for, for mankind through whatever he allows you to go through. That's the goal. To be able to do that, we have to really let go of a lot of the earthly connections and attachments and be really attached to him. So that's the goal. We keep driving toward that. I pray that for you. Father, I love everyone here. I love these people. And I pray that you help me encourage them, those that have come, that those that hear this, that this goes to places where people need to hear this. I do pray, Father, that you allow evil to be exposed, criminality to be exposed, uh, these evil SOBs, Father, these terrible people, 
who have been milking our country dry for years, selling us out from their positions. I pray that you expose all that and bring them to justice. At the same time, I pray that truth and righteousness would rule our nation. Rightness and goodness according to the divine principles. That's what I pray. But even more, Father, whatever you've decided here, you've already decided in the eternity past which way this is headed. And you've, you've, uh, you've determined it based on what's good for us as Christians, not as human beings, as Christians. Therefore, help us to see that and surrender that and be joy, embrace that and be joyful that adversity and even terrible adversity may be coming our way because of who we are in Christ. Help us to embrace that, whatever happens, because that's where we want to be. No matter what happens in our life, that's who and what we want to be as Christians, at that place where we can live with anything and be joyful in the Lord. Now we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.